Okay, now let me get to the really fun part, which is introducing Karen London. I'm going to be very succinct because in my experience when I go to a seminar, I want to hear the speaker. I don't want to hear the in introduction to them. So I will just briefly say, besides having a PhD and being a certified applied animal behaviorist, Karen London is a person I got to know really well when she was a teaching assistant at my class at the University of Wisconsin. And how many people watch MASH? And how many people remember Radar? Do you remember Radar? Meet Radar. Okay, I would say, we'd have a meeting and I would say, Karen, you know, I've been thinking it would be really good to have a list of resources for this topic I'm going to be talking about on Thursday. And Karen would say, actually, I prepared a six-page memo on that. I have, um, I have alternative A or alternative B, depending on which you are interested in. Um, that's Karen. Um, and it's so incredibly appropriate that she's going to talk about play today. One of the things that, that she will be encouraging you to think about is the importance of play and how, and how play is, um, wake up, and how, under, how knowledge about play can, can profoundly enhance your relationship with your dog and add to the joyfulness and fun of your life. And it's so appropriate that she would be the one doing that because Karen is incredibly knowledgeable and probably the most playful person I've ever met. So I'm happy to turn it over to Dr. Karen Lennon. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Trisha. And I want to say that I'm so thrilled to see people eating the chocolate because it makes me feel at one with you, Trisha. I um, left chocolate truffles in my room last night, and that is what I had for breakfast. So chocolate is the breakfast of champions. We're all in the same club. I hope we're properly caffeinated, properly sugared, and ready to go. <laughs> Um, and I do want to say before I really get started talking about what I'm going to be talking about is that I do have a lot of slides and videos and I am strongly of the opinion that you will get more out of the seminar if you can see them. So if you're seated behind someone who is living at a different altitude than you, um, then, then move and there's plenty of open seats so do make sure you can see. Well, I really want to thank everyone for attending. I lived in Wisconsin. I've actually lived here three times. Every time I leave it doesn't take. Um, I just keep coming back and I like it here and I know how rare um, special weather days like this are and I really want to thank you for coming and spending this precious sunny nice you know spring is on a Tuesday kind of day in Wisconsin um, with me it means a lot to me well my primary goal in all of my work with dogs is to improve the relationship between dogs and people and I really think that happens by continuing to learn more about them all the time. And um, this slide talks about learning to understand dogs. It says how to recognize the moods of an Irish setter. And you can see that Irish setters can be happy, depressed, angry, pensive, excited, or suicidal. And um, lest anyone think I'm mocking Irish setters, that is far from the case. I've never owned an Irish setter, but literally every time I see one, especially in the bright sunshine, I think, this is the breed that my heart goes out to, but which I really must not get. Um, and I, I just love them so much. So I'll be discussing play as, as a way of help, hoping that we understand more about dogs after today. And I'll be discussing also the links between play and aggression, but mostly play is the, the big theme. And I'll be talking about play as it relates to the field of animal behavior in general, um, and of course, mostly uh, how it relates to dogs. And I'll be using a mix of uh, case studies, videos, and slides um, to talk about this topic. In the, mostly in the morning, I'm going to be talking about dog-dog play and mostly dog-human play in the afternoon. But there, there's some crossover, but that's sort of the basic outline. Um, and I will be talking about a lot of science, and I think it's really important that anyone interested in dogs understand the science behind what we know about them, but most of what I'll be talking about will be practical in nature, because I feel like really applying what we know about dogs is how we um, really improve that wondrous relationship between dogs and people. This is not my child. I have two sons, not a girl. I, I have girl hair envy and girl clothes envy, but no actual daughters in my home. 
Um, and today, what I want to do is have an informative seminar, and my goal, whenever I go to a seminar, is to get one idea that I take home, either to use with a dog in my own home or with a client's dog, and that's what I'm hoping all of you can get. If you have one idea to think about or one new thing to try, then I will consider the day a success. I don't want to be just a big information spewing situation that causes us to leave here looking like this. Um, although I must say I was very amused when I was thinking about this picture this morning because I live in Arizona and it's really dry and no joke I woke up with the humidity here looking remarkably similar to this dog. Um, I mentioned that that's what I want out of a seminar, sort of one basic idea. I also frankly want to know when I'm going to get to go to the bathroom and when I'm going to get to eat, so I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, we're going to be having a lunch break around noon and we'll be having breaks sort of mid-morning and mid-afternoon. Well, um, the, one of the most important things that I really want to get across today is that play is important. Um, and I think it's great that the world of dog training and behavior and dog lovers has really embraced this idea. Um, I think that we as a community can be really proud of the emphasis that we've placed on play, um, but it is relatively new. Years ago, when I uh, first started talking about play, I used to spend a lot of time at the beginning of talks or seminars justifying the importance of play. And now, I think the field has m changed so much that I'm actually presuming that that's why a lot of you are here, is because you have that supposition that play is important, and it would probably be insulting if I were to tell you how important play is. I assume that's why you're here. Um, and I was actually thinking about this a bit, just how people are talking about play so much, and I actually really kind of think of it um, that the general theme could be play is the new black. You know, play is everywhere. Everybody's really into play right now, and I think that's just such a good progression in the field. And if you think that play is important, then you are certainly not alone. Um, no less a mind than Sigmund Freud said, every playing child behaves like a poet in that he creates a world of his own. It would be unfair to believe that he does not take this world seriously. On the contrary, he takes his play very seriously. The antithesis of play is reality, not seriousness. And what this means is that if you're looking to avoid being serious today, you're out of luck. But if you want to avoid reality, then you are in the right place. <laughs> the idea of make-believe is always present in play. And um, this slide shows that. It says, OK, this time Rex and Zeke will be the wolves, Fifi and Muffin will be the coyotes, and listen, here comes the deer. And there is a lot of, there is a lot of pretend play, or, uh, pretending in play, and that's an important aspect of what it is. Well, I want to talk a little bit about how I got interested in play, and I do think that there's just such a great interest in play right now in our field, which is exciting. Um, and I actually was, well, I was originally trained as an aggression specialist, and that actually really led me to my interest in play. Um, and I think that that's not necessarily obvious how that would happen, but a lot of people that are interested in aggression and work with aggressive dogs do see play issues come up a lot, and not just as some separate issue, but as sort of part and parcel to what's going on. Um, so I'm going to talk about how my aggression work led me to an interest in play. And when I first started seeing aggression cases, I felt like my, my sort of naturally cautious self got sort of overdone. And when I talk about my naturally cautious self sort of dotting my I's and crossing my T's, when Trisha sort of describes me as radar, it's really a nice way of saying that I'm kind of obsessive compulsive. <laughs> and um, I really like to have um, as much um, understanding and control of all the little details. Um, that way I can sleep at night and function, which is good for everybody, especially my husband. <laughs> Um, so this is how nature says do not touch. And you've got your rattling snake, your puffer fish, your you know, cat that you probably don't want to pet, and your typical human sociopath. And uh, I really felt like this sort of was my world when I started seeing aggression cases. I just got so nervous. And I came up with a couple of sort of basic principles of applied animal behavior. And this is what I call the Little Red Riding Hood principle of applied animal behavior, which, not to be too technical about it, just means my what big teeth you have. And the point of this is that aggression is serious because jaws are powerful and teeth are big and sharp. And this seems obvious, but there's a lot of aggression that actually doesn't cause too much in the way of problems. If all dogs ever did was bark and growl and lunge, or if bites never hurt and never caused injury, who would really care? I mean, it might not look pretty, but the issue is that there's actually a risk for fear and, in, um, and injury. That's the problem. And I felt like when I first started seeing aggression cases, I had to really um, deal with that fear. There were dogs in my office that weren't lassie <laughs> some of the time. 
And I remember one of my earliest cases, and it's sort of regrettable that it was one of my early cases, because it probably had too much of an influence on me, but it was a Chesapeake Bay Retriever that had caused really serious injury. It had um, bitten the woman owner on the wrist so badly she had to have surgery for some reconstructive issues with the broken bones, and it had bitten the man when they were outside, and he said, oh, I, I thought we were playing, but I don't think the dog did, and what the dog did was actually bit him on the neck and he had to be taken to the hospital for loss of blood. Now most of the time, of course, I didn't see cases like this, um, but it was just so, such a dramatic thing so early on. And I remember sitting in my office and thinking, only an idiot wouldn't be afraid of this dog. And I was petrified, I was really afraid. And um, another early case involved um, a woman whose son had been bitten by her dog when they were um, wrestle playing. And I asked her how serious the bite was, and I'm always interested in that because you know, some people say a bite is a bite is a bite. It's like, no, a little bite that's a little nip is one thing. That might be a risk you can live with. A bite that is much more serious might be something different. And she said, um, well, I'm not sure how serious the bite was. The plastic surgeon said, and just a little tip from an expert, if you're ever dealing with dog bite cases and there's a plastic surgeon involved, it's a serious bite. <laughs> and she said, the plastic surgeon said, the only reason my, the plastic surgeon said that the only reason my son's eyelid tore was because he pulled away. And it was soon after I saw this case um, that I felt like I really wanted to learn just a little more about um, what was causing some of these aspects of aggression. And I got my PhD studying the defensive behavior of tropical social wasps. And I did get stung and I did, um, you know, experience some, um, some negative interactions <laughs> with my wasp. Um, but I had studied how they protected themselves against predators, and that made a lot of sense to me. I mean, if I bother their nest to see how they react and they react, I'm not startled by that. But some of the things, some of the dogs I did um, really surprised me, and it really seemed like some of these things were not what I could call sort of normal or expected. And one of the first bits of reading that I did was a, a study of violent criminals. Um, and this study, this was in the 1960s, this was in humans, found a link between play abnormalities of children and violent adults. And in the, the study of murderers that, they, that this psychiatrist looked at, 90% of them had an absence of play as children. And I mean, how many children do you know that don't play? An absence of play is a really interesting observation. Um, and then um, a lot of them also had um, abnormal play. So they had things like bullying, sadism, extreme teasing, and of course, cruelty to animals. And I'm not trying to say cruelty to animals is play, it's not, but this was how the children were engaging in sort of their playful side. And this study was prompted by a psychiatrist who was assigned to the case of Charles Whitman. And Charles Whitman was the man who in the 1960s climbed up to the top of the tower at the University of Texas in Austin and shot a bunch of people. He killed 13, he wounded 31, and then he was actually gunned down by, I think, a police officer and some volunteer. Um, and the um, governor of Texas actually ordered a study into what prompted his behavior. And this was a man who was kind of had a squeaky clean image. He was a Marine, he was an Eagle Scout, he was an altar boy, um, but he also, um, was a child that his teachers remembered not playing spontaneously. He cowered at the side of the um, playground when the other kids were playing. This just says, I wouldn't do that. Mr. Old Zeke's liable to fire that sucker up. And I, I just love this because literally I feel like this actually, something that not that different from this does sort of happen. Um, I think that people often don't recognize a potential aggression. And there's all, a lot of issues with play and aggression actually being misdiagnosed. To me, the most feared phrase at a dog park is, oh, that's just how he plays. <laughs> Sometimes that's a very worrisome sort of statement. Um, I wanted to mention in, in the line of um, some of the links between play and aggression and how my aggression led to an, in not my aggression, <laughs> not that aggressive, how, um, <laughs> how my interest in aggression led to my interest in play is the issue of play and aggression being confused with each other a lot. Sometimes people think dogs are being aggressive with each other and it's play. Sometimes dog, people think dogs are playing and that I do think there's an aggression tendency. Um, childhood play abnormalities are common and violent. Um, and um, an interesting observation that Jane Goodall make is that orphan chimpanzees often cease to play and depressed chimpanzees often cease to play and both these groups of chimpanzees are often predisposed to aggression as they get older.
Um, and I want to mention one more case that I saw not quite so early on, but after I've been doing it for a couple of years, um, but in that sort of that's just how he plays or you know, he doesn't know how to play, these kind of comments that we hear a lot. There was a German shepherd that I, I saw who had some serious issues with play. It was actually not one of these German shepherds. These were four German shepherds that were my roommates at dog camp. And if you're going, looking from left to right, um, one, two, three, four, um, how many people feel, which, which dog do you think might have had sort of the, some of the behavior issues? One, two, three, or four? Two, yeah. Yes. That is Zoe, who her owner described as, it's hard to be Zoe all day, every day. I walked into my room, and three German shepherds went, ha, 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 and Zoe came up and nipped me on the arm. And I thought, oh, it's going to be a heck of a weekend. <laughs> um, but um, I did see this German shepherd that was, I, did, I don't have a picture of. Um, and the owners actually were very concerned because they said their, their dog didn't know how to play with children. And they were going to be having their nephew visit them for most of the summer, an eight-year-old nephew. And what they said is a three-year-old German shepherd um, had almost no socialization and was really obsessive about ball and frisbee play. And not the sort of obsessive that a lot of dogs are, they just really love their balls. I mean, really obsessive. Sort of, if there was a frisbee or ball in sight, the dog was frantic till it could get to it, really in distress. And whenever he's around kids, um, he followed them in sort of an obsessive stalking way and mouthed at their feet in that same kind of obsessive way that he mouthed at his frisbee. I and mean, then every time he'd been around kids, um, when he was playing fetch, he'd knocked kids over, grabbed their clothes, and he'd dragged and bitten them. Um, and my feeling was that he did not regard kids as social partners. They were objects to him. And the owners wanted to know, and I, sometimes I don't know how serious people view an issue that they're having, but I knew these people thought it was really serious because the question they asked for me is, do you think our dog could ever kill a child? And um, I, I told them that I, I didn't think that that was their dog's intent, but that the dog could seriously injure a, a child because it was grabbing at them and biting at them and knocking them down. It was treating it like an object, and an object you can be rough with in a way that you can't with play partners. And I just mention this case because I think people so often say, oh, he just doesn't really know how to play. And this is how serious that can get. Um, I want to talk about the five major reasons that dogs are aggressive and how that can have an impact in play. All of these issues, fear, pain, status, frustration, and arousal, can come up in play. And that's why so often play can segue into aggression. Um, fear is probably the major cause of aggression that I see in cases. Um, probably 80% of the aggressive dogs that I've seen have fear as some component um, of that. And dogs who get overwhelmed in play or get confused or aren't sure that something playful can become afraid. And that, is, that can make them react aggressively in a defensive way. Um, and to think about how fear can cause aggression, when you think about some of those old movies with somebody that's on guard duty and you know, one person sort of has their gun and they're just like, hmm, hmm, do I hear something? Hmm, I wonder when my ship's over. That's not a fearful person. The person that's like, what's that? What's that? I hear a twig. Oh my gosh. That's the person that you do not want to have a gun in their hand. That's an itchy trigger finger. And that's how fear can result in problems. Um, pain is, can be a cause of aggression, and that can certainly come up in play. If another dog inadvertently hurts a dog, that can cause a problem. And to me, the easiest example of how pain is, is, can, can cause aggression, the easiest way to think about it, is that it's in the movies all the time, women who are giving birth and are really, really mean to their husband. That is pain causing aggression. Um, and frankly, quite understandable. <laughs> um, status issues can, can come up in play. When dogs start to try to work things out a little bit more seriously or their play takes on serious overtones, that can result in aggression. If there's something that, 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 that sort of playful aspect of play is lost to something they're trying to work out. Um, frustration can come up in play when dogs can't reach the dog that they want to, they can't complete the actions that they want to, um, or they can't get some kind of toy or object that they want. And to think about frustration causing aggression, all you have to do is think of the last time that you literally had to restrain yourself from throwing your computer out the window. You knew you would regret it, but you were frustrated. Um, I'm from LA, and you'd think I would have road rage, but I actually have what I call technology rage, which means that I know that computers turn on me in times of trouble. <laughs> that frustration can cause aggression. Um, probably the biggest um, major factor of aggression that can come up in play is arousal. Um, arousal causes anyone to be um, less inhibited, less in control of their actions, and just generally more distressed. So arousal can cause play to spiral up to where it's out of control, and that can lead to aggression. 
Well, when I watch play and I'm trying to evaluate it, I'm almost always worried about trouble that could occur. So I'm watching for signs of any of these kinds of things. And what I want to do now is that I'm going to show a couple of clips, a couple of video clips of dogs playing. And I'll tell you a little bit about them. And what I'd like to do is I'll play the first one. They're each a couple minutes long. And I want you to just watch it and sort of think about, does this look, does this play look OK? What do I see that's good? What do I see that doesn't look good? Would I separate the dogs at any point? Um, and then um, I'd like to give you a couple minutes just to talk with the people near you about you know, what, what you saw. And I'll be talking throughout the day about what kind of things I used to evaluate, but I just want to start sort of with all of us with fresh minds um, looking at, at, at these kind of plays. And this is a videotape of two young dogs. Um, it, they were at a field station where I've done some work in Nicaragua, and they're probably about 10 or 11 months old, but um, I wasn't sure. Um, one thing to note is how well fed they appear. That's pretty unusual in Nicaragua, but this is at a field station. A lot of biologists come and feed them. Um, they're pretty social and comfortable in their environment. Um, and they're, they're pretty similar in size. And their names, which I think are kind of cute, are Lola and Lalo. So you're studying uh, the insects yes. or the insects? Right, the ecology. We okay. use it as so. Okay. Okay. Will they be down here a while? Or? Just two weeks. Yeah. Looks ready, guys. All right. Go ahead. just to introduce yourself to one, two, or three, or four people around you and just talk about what you saw. And if you didn't have an opinion, feel free to say so. I, I've learned from nine years of marriage that I just remembered I have no opinion is always a useful phrase. 
if I could get everyone's attention um, back again, um, I'm so pleased because I know there are a lot of people here who know each other and I actually checked on a few groups to make sure they were talking about what they were supposed to be talking about and they indignantly assured me that they were. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to have some people comment on some of the things that they observed and um, Colleen is going to be trying to come around to you with the microphone so um, we'll, I know a lot of us are dog trainers, we'll get the timing down for sure. <laughs> um, would anyone have something they'd like to share about something they observed with that? Um, a lot of it was very interesting to me, and I recognize a lot of it. However, there was one part that really caught my attention, and I'd like to know more about it. And that part is where there was a distraction. Somebody was on the outside, and the black dog started a tail wag. And then the white dog kind of looked at the black dog like, oh, okay, I could do that. That's all right. like a checking in or something. And then the, the white dog started wagging his tail. And then there was a, like a common approach toward the distraction objects. So that thought, I found that very intriguing in the midst of things. Yeah, I think something that you're pointing out in the play is that there was really a lot going on. I mean, there were people, there were objects, there were things, there were a lot of pauses. Are you talking about the distraction of the object on the grass or the man who came down from the hill? I didn't see the person moving, but at that point I only saw the two dogs looking at something else, so I'm assuming it's the man that was coming down the hill. Uh -huh. Yeah, it could be. I don't know. It's a good point. Anybody else about things they observed on this? The main thing that I noticed was that it seemed to me that about the first third or close to a half, the two dogs were playing with each other and just bouncing around and maybe wrestling a little bit and kind of breaking off and taking turns on who was on top and I didn't see a lot of teeth. And then the white dog went and laid down and started to chew on whatever the object was which to me looked like a dead squirrel but maybe it was a toy, I don't know. And the black dog decided it wanted that. And then there was a lot more rougher interaction which started to look more like an argument over the object rather than play so much. And there were a lot more teeth from both of them and a lot of chewing on legs and chewing on necks and things that looked more serious but not necessarily aggressive so much as just there is a real focus on this activity now and it's I want it, no I want it, no I want it, no I want it. And the white dog got it back again at the end it seems like what you're talking about is really a sort of a change in the leg level of vigor of the play. Yes, yes. Anybody else? Just right across the aisle, thanks. So I find that interesting because our group saw something very different. Um, our group actually did see that the the tan and white was interested in the object. Um, there does appear to be an established relationship between these two dogs. It doesn't appear like these are two dogs who are figuring out a play style with each other, that they've played prior, that they've, they know each other a bit, and that there is some established language there. And while the tan and white was interested in the object, we felt that the black and white was more interested in the interaction with the tan and white, not so much the object itself. Um, and we were quite comfortable with actually most of that play um, because there was a lot of role reversal. And even though the tan and white seemed a bit frustrated um, that, hey, I want to chew here and I don't want to play right now, the black and white said, hey, I want to play right now. And so there was, even though there was some tension a bit, we were very comfortable with the negotiation that was happening between the two. Um, you're right about them playing quite a bit together. These are the only two dogs that live at this field station, and they were about the same age, and they did play together sort of all day, every day. Anybody else? Well, I think we uh, tend to agree with what you just said. Um, basically, though, what we saw at the beginning was mutually agreed kind of behaviors. They were alternating. Um, they would, uh, one would do one, the other would uh, do something very similar to that. But after the interaction with the person and they go back, their arousal level was notice noticeably higher. And um, the, the lighter colored dog was showing a lot of cutoff signals. Um, he, was, he was definitely throwing several signals of I'm done playing and the black dog uh, decided to ignore those. And, and the arousal level did get up. I didn't think that it was, or we didn't think that it was necessarily uh, an arousal level that could go bad, but you can definitely see where that could ratchet up 
and especially if the black dog failed to eventually acknowledge those cutoff signals, then you could actually have a, uh, an interaction. But it was obvious these guys had a mutual agreement about how they play. Um, but they, it did ratchet up, but it wasn't, at least we didn't interpret it as being necessarily a dangerous situation, but you can see it where it could go that way. Um, one of the things I want to point out that I just think is so great about play, and I'm, I'm very comfortable with it as a scientist, is there are so many different views and perspectives. And I like to say that plot play divides, confuses. <laughs> um, it, people have really different perspectives. And I'm going to share with you my perspective on this, um, on this interaction. Um, I'm comfortable with the way they play. I think it, they're young dogs. They are pretty exuberant. Their arousal level changes. Um, but they're very, um, they're comfortable with each other. They're, um, they do have, the black one does seem to be more interested in playing than the white one, but it didn't ever seem, in my opinion, to lead to any particular problem. Um, the black one does eventually, you know, back off at various times. And I consider this to be pretty appropriate play. I was actually, I was there in Nicaragua in July of last year checking out this field station for a class I, I taught at the university where I live. And I really wanted to go back and see what these dogs were like when I was there in March. But unfortunately, one of them just wasn't there. And I asked people, you know, where, the, the white one was there, the black one wasn't there, you know, where's Lola? And they just said in Spanish, basically, I shame. So I'm assuming something quite bad happened to the dog, but I don't know. They did have a, another dog there that never played with the white one. I'm going to show a second um, play sequence. Um, and this involves two dogs in a puppy class that, that I was teaching. And um, it's a Westie and a teddy bear. And I'd like you again to watch and be ready to discuss what you see. Cooper. And I do want to say while you discuss it, like this is my puppy class, but I, I, I know there are some issues, okay, so don't be shy about talking about that. <laughs> well, you guys are good talkers. That is a good thing. Um, again, I'd like to hear from people what they observed in this, in this um, play interaction between these two dogs. And I should have mentioned, I forgot, they were about six or seven months old. We were a lot less comfortable with this group than the two before. Um, seemed that there was, especially toward the beginning, that there was a lot of offense defense, um, that the terrier, there was no row reversals, that the terrier was always on top, a little intense. Um, the other, the teddy bear that you called him, um, he did attempt to remove himself from play several times and the terrier did pursue him. Um, although it looked toward the end that the teddy bear was sort of kind of getting his sea legs a little, um, was finally standing up a bit, but we were a much less comfortable with this particular group than we were with the two before. I actually saw it as a little more extreme than that. Um, it, it seemed to me that the, the teddy bear really was trying to get away and when they were playing more together at the end it just seemed like the teddy bear was trying to defend itself. But one of the problems that I had was that it, because there are other puppies elsewhere in the room, I couldn't tell whether any of the yips which are important cues for me, were coming from them or from other dogs in the room. Right. 
Yeah, so that and there, made it there's difficult. at least one instance. Some of the yips are hard to tell. There is at least one instance where the teddy bear does yip and the Westie does not back off at all. It does not stop it, which you're right, is, a, is, a, is an issue. Um, I agree that initially I uh, was concerned, but my apprehension was eased as time went by. There was a human that inter, um, initiated a break two or three times for the Westie, and you did see the teddy bear, just like a magnet, go right back to that dog. Had that dog really been threatened by the Westie, the teddy bear would have removed itself completely. Um, maybe about halfway through the play, um, they started to switch roles a little bit more. The teddy bear seemed to kind of stand up more for itself, and you saw the Westie height seeking standing up on his hind legs. Um, but then eventually, towards the end, the teddy bear seemed to take a little bit more of a dominant role, and they were switching roles, and I was a little bit more comfortable as time went by, but initially I would have um, definitely initiated a break for that Westie several times. It seemed to help him. <laughs> we were discussing that at the end, it seemed to us more that the teddy bear wasn't so much playing as was kind of acting out of frustration. Um, and so I guess that would have, even though they were finally interacting, I probably would have interfered um, or I would have you know, initiated a break um, just because it was kind of that on the edge, you know, it could go okay, or, but based on the previous interactions, um, I probably would have given a little bit of a break um, because what I saw was when the Westie was pulled off and would have the break, it wasn't so much that the teddy bear was like, hey, come on, come on, why'd you stop, why'd you stop? It was, okay, are you coming after me again? What's going on? And then would tend to kind of move away. Um, the dogs that I've seen when I've done kind of the bully test and, and pulled one dog off and the other dog wants to play, um, the other dog is just completely all over the, you know, the dog that we're giving the time out to. And I, I didn't see that with the teddy bear. I, I saw more apprehension with the teddy bear. Okay. Good. Those are great comments. And I, too, am a lot less comfortable with that play than I was with the play from the first one. For all the reasons you're saying, the Westie was essentially a little bit too much for the teddy bear. Um, the teddy bear seemed to benefit from some of the pauses. Um, the arousal level is a lot higher. Um, this was, I'm not sure which day of uh, which class this, this was, whether it was like the second or third in the series of six. Um, when I tried putting these dogs in different play groups, all they did was go up to the fence near each other and sort of both whimper. And um, they wanted to play with each other, or it seemed to me that they did. Um, knowing what I know now, I would have separated and given them more breaks, but I do think that there was interest in play on, on both parts. Um, but it's definitely the kind of play that I think merits watching because of the high arousal, because of some hesitation from the teddy bear. Um, well, great. I really liked what people were discussing as I sort of walked around and eavesdropped um, and, um, and that kind of comments that you guys had. So that's really good. Um, I'm going to be talking now sort of about some general ways to tell appropriate from inappropriate play. And this is always a bit of a dicey subject because there are lots of exceptions. Um, play is not something that's clear cut in a lot of ways. Um, but there is one rule that is unbreakable. So th every rule has an exception, including this one. The rule that has no exception is that all dogs must be willing participants. Now, assessing that is not always necessarily a, a matter of great ease, but this is the one rule that is unbreakable for when dogs are playing. If there's any suspicion that one or more dogs are not comfortable with the play and don't want to seem to be uncomfortable with it, even if what the other dog's doing seems totally appropriate by sort of standard canine standards, and there needs to be some kind of intervention. Um, so the, I'm going to talk about what I consider my general rules and guidelines for dogs playing and then give some, um, show some slides of some specifics of that. So the first, as I said, all dogs must be willing participants. Um, and that really relates to everybody should be having a good time. Um, play is by, um, really by definition, involved with having fun. And if someone's not having fun, then the playful atmosphere that you'd want does not exist. Um, there needs to be respect for other dogs and their bodies. It doesn't mean it can't be pretty rough sometimes. I mean, it, there, it is a physical, social play is a physical contact sport, but there needs to be respect. Um, mouthing can't be too hard. Dogs do mouth and play, it's appropriate, but obviously, you know, mouthing that's too hard is a, is a problem. You're not going to have willing participants then. Um, I, I object to pinning, like throwing a dog on the ground and, and sort of, you know, flattening them, pinning dogs, I, I'm, I don't consider a good thing. Call me radical. Um, yelps mean to stop and regroup. One of the things I didn't like in the play with the Westie and the teddy bear was that the teddy bear did yelp one time and it sh the, the Westie showed no change in behavior. 
Um, I don't like to see excessive sustained noise. And noise in play, dogs do growl when they play. Sometimes there's barks, there's occasionally yips. But if it's just noisy all the time, if it's just constant without breaks, that concerns me. Um, and that dogs still need to listen to our cues when they're playing. That's a general guideline of playing. Um, if you're asking them to come or to sit, they should still be doing that. It doesn't mean that you can demand it of it. They have to be trained to do it. You can't demand it of them without training them. But that is sort of a general rule of play. And then if play is not being done nicely, then it ends um, for at least some dogs. Um, and I'm going to show a video now of a dog that to me does not seem to be a willing participant. Um, there are three huskies, two puppies, and an adult. Um, the puppy that, um, that I do not think is a willing participant, his name is Hemi. And you do, see, you do hear somebody in the background say, oh, it's time, I think they say it's time to beat up on Hemi, sort of in a worried tone. And I actually need to um, go, this one won't pay in my PowerPoint. All my videos will play in this, except for this one, and I don't know why. And I just accept this the same way I accept that when I'm in a hurry, all the lights are red. <laughs> You'll have a little retirement community. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Eat up Hemi time. <laughs> Kiska. You, you'll hear me comment. I get sort of distressed about this. Does this happen to him a lot? Yeah. yeah. Do you ever interrupt it? Yeah. Hey. Do you want to? I think maybe you should. I'm pretty distressed. <laughs> okay. And it goes on like that for some time. And I, I, these were not clients of mine. I was just videotaping. They asked me to do some videotaping. And so I feel bad when I watch that because for social reasons, I was not interrupting that as much as I would have liked to. I was sort of asking them to do it, but I was not very effective at it, unfortunately. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that that dog that was under was not a willing participant. So there's no. Um, there, there's really nothing about that that was okay for that dog. You know, I, I really, um, I really um, love this dog, this top dog. Her name is Rhonda. We share a birthday, the 4th of July. Um, she had issues, and I'm, I'm not being disrespectful. Her owner knows that I say this. I, I mean this in the most loving way. She was a little bitch, but I loved her. <laughs> She's just a really neat dog, um, but without issues. Um, and I actually think it's kind of interesting. She was a very playful dog, and I think that is really important. I'll be talking about this quite a bit for how attached you, you feel. I, I just loved her sort of, you know, just her vigor and her style and her joy, but she was a, a very difficult dog. And you would never meet a dog that was like this to live with and say, oh, I know the dog would be perfect for your family. But meeting her, I just really loved her. Um, and whether or not play is appropriate, it can be really tricky to assess um, from general guidelines. And I, I think the best analogy is it's a little bit like trying to decide whether some kind of teasing or some kind of risque joke at work is sexual harassment or appropriate or teasing. It really depends. It depends on people's moods and um, their interactions with each other and their past history and, and the general climate. And there's a lot of individual variation. Um, there are certain things, and in and, and certain situations, like probably most of us can, for example, be teased about a lot of things, um, but not other things. Like I, for example, am perfectly happy to be teased about my you know, horrible singing, but I don't necessarily want to be teased about anything about my intelligence proper. That would be insulting to me, but I know I can't sing. Um, and it's the same kind of thing with dogs in that it's just this very vague kind of assessment issue. Um, so a lot of the rules that I'm going to be talking about in the specifics are really sort of the the most conservative, worst case scenario kind of guidelines. And there are a lot of things that I would recommend against that you might have dogs say, oh, well, I let them do that. There might be extenuating circumstances, because there are a lot of exceptions. Um, so one of the things is that um, if one dog seems hesitant in any way or doesn't seem to want to go back to play, 
then that's, a, and then that's an issue. Um, if any dog is obviously frightened or hurt or yelping or overwhelmed, um, that's not okay. Um, Dr. Seuss is a great philosopher. I think it's obvious. <laughs> and um, he emphasized the importance of fun when he said in The Cat in the Hat, it's fun to have fun, but you have to know how. And here, the cat is having a really great time, but the fish is miserable. He's saying, put me down, said the fish. This is no fun at all. Put me down, said the fish. I do not wish to fall. And this, to me, is what you see in play a lot. One individual like, yeehaw, this is great fun, and one that's like, Either, hey, knock it off, or I'm not so sure about this. So that's something that always needs to be assessed. Um, switching positions is generally a good thing. Um, but just because dogs don't switch position doesn't actually mean it's a bad thing. So it is good to see one dog chasing and then another dog chasing, or switching back and forth, or one dog being on top and switching. But there's a pretty recent study in 2007 um, by Erica Bauer and Barbara Smuts. Um, and it, it's called Cooperation and Competition During Dyadic Play in Domestic Dogs. And in their study, um, they conclude that dogs can maintain a playful atmosphere without this uh, kind of role reversal. Um, that the role, role reversal can be a good sign of good play, but it's not a necessary part of it. Um, they observed asymmetrical, asymmetrical behavior in pairs of dogs, um, in which dogs were really different in status or really different in age, and that, that, that was still playful. Um, they did see role reversals a lot during chasing and, and tackling behavior, but in terms of muzzle bites, muzzle licks, and mounting, they didn't see that sort of reciprocal behavior, even in interactions that were, um, that were still playful. So what their results really suggest is what we already know about play, which is that um, the individual dogs and the individual situation need to be part of our assessment of what's appropriate play. The more we know about dogs, individual dogs, the more you can assess them. The more background knowledge you have, it's much harder to assess just two random dogs or more that you see playing than dogs that you have some kind of history on. Oh, um, it's Erica Bauer, B-A-U-E-R, and Barbara Smuts, S-M-U-T-S. Um, when you do see dogs that are having asymmetries, something you want to assess is, and this is a subjective thing, whether the dog that is sort of in the inferior position, either always being chased or always underneath, seems to want to get away. And I watch these two dogs play, and it's the, um, the shepherd often seems to be trying to get out from under, but not successfully. And that kind of asymmetry is worrisome. Generally, when dogs are playing, jaws open is a good thing. Um, Generally in dogs, you know, that sort of open mouth, ha, 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 kind of happy thing is a, is a good thing. Jaws with, dogs with tension in their jaws and mouth closed, more worrisome, and that's true in play as in anything else. So open mouth, like you see here. Um, closed mouth, like you see on this Aussie on your right, is um, often a sign of tension in the play. Um, inhibited play bites are a big part of play. Dogs do bite a lot when they play. Um, but you don't want them to be too long-lasting. And I, I particularly get concerned when I see really hard, long-lasting bites around the neck for a long time. So a dog that's just holding on like this, just sort of clamped on, I don't necessarily like to see that. And I'm going to show a video um, that I don't, um, that has behavior where one dog just seems to be chewing on to the other one. And I actually just sometimes ask people for videos, and this is just a woman that I know in Flagstaff, and she said, I have some play of my dogs, and this did not seem problematic to her at all, but it did to me. And I think that sustained chewing at the neck is something that I don't like to see. Sure. Oh, can you just, I'm sorry, could you wait for the microphone? In situations like that, uh, apart from separating the dogs, if the, the dog on the bottom, so to speak, is interested in playing but not playing so rough, is there a way to restore the balance a little bit? Um, yeah, there are some possibilities. Um, certainly separating them sometimes does make that stop. In some cases, not with those dogs. Um, you can sometimes yelp, and the dog that's gripped will sometimes release. 
One of the best things that I like to do with toy motivated dogs is try to get the dog that's doing the mouthing to get a toy in their mouth so that they're not, um, they, their mouth basically isn't available to go at the other dog. Thank you. Free time is over. <laughs> um, oh, well, actually, sorry. Something that I do like to see a lot in play is a lot of chasing and parallel running. And I actually feel like something that dogs do a lot is want to move in the same direction together. That's actually why I think taking dogs for walks together um, is a great way to have them have some kind of interaction without necessarily forcing them into a small confined area to do the sort of social play that's often encouraged. Just moving and going places is good. Um, and I'm going to show a video um, which, <laughs> if you're prone to it and you didn't bring your Dramamine today, sorry, it's one of those kind of really, really topsy-turvy ones. And since I didn't say that about any of the other ones, you can imagine. But these are two dogs. They're young dogs, less than a year old. Um, I talked to the owners at this park. This was the first time these dogs had met each other. And they're just, they give each other quite a bit of space. And they're just doing a lot of running together. And I really like that kind of play. And I feel like a lot of times we tend to look for play that's that sort of rolling frenzy and don't emphasize chasing as much. And I, I really like the chase games that dogs play. And something that's generally good to see in play is rolling, um, dogs that roll onto their back um, or roll with each other. A lot of um, batting of paws um, and sort of brief pounce overs when they just sort of leap up at each other briefly. Um, and generally anything else, and I mentioned this before, that sort of represents a, a respect for space and, and for, for each other's bodies. These are dogs that did a lot of parallel running. And what I love about this slide so much, um, that's a lab, not a Rottweiler. It's a lab that lost its tail, and then it's got this pointer with this tail. And I just, this family had sort of, they always said they had the right number of tails in their family, but just on the wrong dogs. Um, generally not good is, is in a sort of a general sense, is things that show a lack of respect for, um, for space or someone else's body. And I'm going to show a video of some dogs that just really aren't playing that well together. And one of the dogs just sort of really goes at another one, um, kind of nips it on the bottom. And a lot of people say, well, it's a, it's a hurting dog. It, you know, they do sometimes tend to nip. But they really shouldn't be doing that in play. Everyone has a time in their life when they learn how to use slow motion, so this video happened at that time. And what I feel like the major problem in the, with the play with these dogs is that these are dogs that don't have the same kind of play styles. I wouldn't have these dogs playing together. Um, but I had this videotape of them doing so. <laughs> Something I don't like to see a lot of in play is paw overs, where they put their paws over the back of the, the dog's body. It's status-related move that is not usually received very well by other dogs. Um, Chin-overs as well. These are the same two dogs doing that chin-over and that paw-over. Um, I lots of times feel like when dogs are doing that, they're actually trying to work things out in play, and it's difficult to maintain a playful atmosphere. Sometimes as dogs are just moving about in a way that appears random in space, they can be in these sort of positions briefly, but if there's a sort of what looks more like a pointed effort to do that sort of paw-over or chin-over, I don't like to see that. Um, I also don't like to see um, dogs up on their hind legs a lot. Besides for orthopedic reasons, just from a play point of view, when they're doing what I tend to call vertical play, I don't really care for that. I feel like they're, they are trying to get very serious. Sometimes it happens when both dogs seem to have an interest in doing paw overs or chin overs. And when that vertical play involves clasping, it's even more worrisome. Um, I think that lots of times dogs that are doing these kind of behaviors, the, the vertical play and the clasping, sometimes head for trouble. Um, a lot of mounting in play I don't like to see. Um, and I, I'm, these two dogs live together, and the black one always mounted this other one. And the white one always had this poor look on its face like, oh boy, here we go again. It's really unfortunate. And I'm going to show um, a video of some dogs that have some mounting um, issues. And these are two dogs that live together.
And it's sort of interesting, when they each have a toy in their mouth, they do much better. And um, these were some people I worked with in New Hampshire, and we were trying to get play of various appropriateness, and that's why they take one away. Notice also the stiffness in their bodies. They're not as relaxed right here as dogs usually are in play. And one could seriously argue at this point, are these dogs even playing? There's something going on. But they did start out in a sort of slightly playful way, running around with each having a toy. And this was just a few minutes later. Did anyone have a concern right before this dog mounted that something actually more serious might happen? Did you see the tension in them? Um, those two dogs lived in the household together, and literally as long as they each had a toy in their mouth, they tended to be able to, um, to, play, to you know, interact in a way that didn't cause trouble. Um, they never actually got into any kind of fight or interaction, but I was always worried about them. Can you just say a little bit more about mounting and play? Um, a lot of times, especially when puppies, you will see, or I have noticed that dogs that don't know how to play quite as well will often use this as a, uh, just as something to replace it with. I don't know what to do, I'm going to do this instead. And of course you have the other effect, which is the embarrassment of the owner who goes, oh no, my dog is doing this. And at what point do you start becoming uh, concerned? And again, I'm thinking more in puppies. Mm -hmm. um, uh it's interesting. Um, to me, there's sort of two types of mounting that happen in play. One is sort of what I would consider serious mounting, like what this dog is doing. Um, a lot of dogs seem to just mount when they get sort of revved up and aroused. And they, th those mounts are, in my experience, th they're usually quicker. They sort of pass through. Sometimes if you go to intervene, it's already over. Um, I, there, I do see puppies that tend to, to mount, but I don't actually see it where they actually mount from the back and like a true mount and thrust. They just tend to sort of do what I consider sort of pounces and they go over and they'll do it from any angle so they end up sort of anywhere. I generally try to discourage puppies from doing that because it's just, I figure there are other habits that are, are better to, to establish. But I think your point is well taken that lots of times puppies just sort of for, you know, I, I feel like I, I, can, I can almost imagine a cartoon bubble over a puppy's head as they leap on another dog like, what am I doing up here? Um, sometimes. But I generally do try to discourage it. But I, I think mounting like what you see in this, I definitely interrupt and discourage. And usually actually separate the dogs. You know, not just separate and let them go back, but just separate them. Does that answer your question? Um, something that I really don't like to see and play a lot of, and this is a, a rule with a lot of exceptions, is body slamming, a lot of hip and shoulder slams. Now, I know everybody with a northern breed is like, but then they would never play. And I know that. I mean, that, you know, that Malamutes are sort of famous for it. In fact, um, I was hoping to get some really good play of Malamutes body slamming when I was videotaping those Malamutes for those people, but I, they just didn't really do that much of it. Um, I also see, um, it seems like, 
sort of different than what you might expect, but certainly a lot of the northern breeds do body slam, and that is appropriate play, although you have to be very careful who you let them play with. Um, you don't necessarily want them to you know, be running around with a whippet <laughs> doing that, but um, as if they could catch the whippet anyway. Um, but um, I also see that poodles do a lot of, of play that's um, it's not body slamming in the very sort of powerful force led kind of body slams, but I do feel like they have a lot of sideways movement that, in collisions and run into each other. Um, but generally, I don't like to see a lot of body slamming. I like to see a lot of periodic play bows and other pauses in the action. Since arousal is such a huge issue in dog play, um, when dogs are able to pause, I think that that is a really important factor. If they are themselves inhibiting enough to calm down and stop the play, even if it's just for a second or two, I think that's a really great sign that the play, um, that the play ha um, is fairly appropriate. Um, I don't like to see excessive and increasing arousal and escalating growls. This is how attack wiener dogs are trained. Um, and I can't tell you how hard it is for me to say with seriousness the term wiener dog, but that's what's written here. <laughs> um, so anything that's sort of an escalation is really um, concerning. And here this is saying, you know, come on, come on, grr, come on, come on, the sort of a goading escalation kind of aspect to it. Um, what I'd like to do now is show some, some videos that are just about play. Some of them have some appropriate play and some don't. Um, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about each one as I go. Um, I'm going to show you, the, you know, the two dogs that were the one was grabbing at the neck all the time? I'm going to show a videotape of those dogs. And the situation with these dogs is that the sort of model dog is a, a seven-year-old female. Um, the rust-colored one is a five-year-old male. And that dog is very possessive of people, toys, dogs, um, food. And the, the model dog used to be able to get the ball when they were fetching and playing games. And she had um, an ACL tear um, and surgery. And now she's a lot less resistant. Um, and the, the dog that had the ACL tear that never gets the ball, she was the one doing the mouthing in the other one, the biting. And it's interesting to me how different contexts seem to have uh, different effects in play. Drop. And you see the tongue flicking by that dog, and she does a stress yawn too. Here's a clip from another day. And I think it's interesting to look just how much attention the model dog is paying to the, to the ball.
And uh, I was talking at a seminar once, and I talked about this, and I, I said, you know, I, I felt like it was unfortunate that the one dog seems not to have the same kind of access. And um, a lot of the people there said, well, you know, who are we to say, you know, they're dogs, and how do we know that isn't just how they, they play? And, you know, they, this is the way that they do it. And I say, fine, but if it were my dog, I would play with each of those dogs individually some of the time and let them get a chance. I mean, it's especially knowing the history that the one dog used to seem to be more um, sort of uh, strong in her efforts to get the ball. And um, I know I'm anthropomorphizing wildly, which <laughs> I do all the time, so why should I even apologize, um, that I just really feel for that dog. I feel like she... You know, I'm surprised she didn't get more frustrated. I just, I kind of, I, know, I mean, I, I, in some hands, like, oh, it's only a fetch game, but it's like she wants the ball. Let her get it, at least sometimes. Um, the next, um, the next um, video I'm going to show, let me see, it's about to be revealed to me. Well, ah. um, this is um, two dogs. The black one is my. Um, a dog that I used to have, and he is half black lab and half handsome stranger. And I strongly suggest that when you see him, you say, aww, you know, because he's my dog. And the other one is an Australian Shepherd that lived across the street. And these are dogs that play pretty seriously with each other. Um, they're pretty rough. Um, and um, the Australian Shepherd is, a, I think, a year and a half at this point, and the people across the street from me who were in their 90s got this dog, and the dog used to come to our house for exercise. So I had mixed feelings about it in the sense that, um, it wasn't the best play partner for my buddy, but the dog did need some exercise. But I would not let these dogs play um, unattended by any stretch of the imagination. And do you see the slams that they're doing? I think they're getting a bit rough. And this is what their play tended to be like. They didn't tend to have a lot of breaks. And that's a chin over. That's a bit much. And uh, both of those dogs, I think, were very um, like, hey, what are you doing? Um, my dog, who is the black one, who um, I didn't hear any Oz, by the way. Whatever. Thank you. Um, <laughs> maybe he's all black. He's not very photogenic. I understand. Um, but he, um, he was pretty status seeking, um, tended to be over the top of dogs a bit much. Um, and the other one was just the sort of like, um, the best way I would describe the Aussie is that she had a strong sense of self. She was pretty pushy about, about everything. Um, the next dog, I'm gonna, uh, the next video I'm going to show is just some dogs in class, and there's just an issue over a toy. And um, I know it'll be very shocking to all of you because you've probably never, ever, ever seen this, but there is a dog that pees on a piece of equipment. I know it's never happened in any of the classes you'd ever be in. And I felt sorry for the owner that it happened to because their dog never, ever peed on anything, and a lot of the other dogs did, and then in the video, this dog does. Very sad. Usually behavior problems go away when you turn on the video, too, so it's very strange. And you'll see it in slow motion, too. And um, the dog that sort of is on the receiving end of that, the, the look on the dog's face is sort of pathetic in a sad way. And you can see the tension in the dog. It looks like, oh, whoops. And um, these two dogs weren't playing with each other, but it, there was play, there was toys involved. And it's just sort of a caution about, you know, so many dogs do so great as long as there's not certain toys around. It's a relatively easy thing to control in most settings. There's a question. In relation to the dog peeing on the, the piece of equipment, I didn't quite catch what you said. Did you say usually behaviors go away during oh, play? Yeah, I was just saying, you know, I'm always trying to get interesting behavior on videotape. and. Um, there are dogs that are reliably do something like really horrible, like an amazing bark charge that would be so dramatic. You turn a video camera on them and they're suddenly like the perfect dog. So that's all I was referring to. Yes. <laughs> yes. Has anyone else had that experience? Yeah, it's a nightmare. <laughs> Just when you actually want bad behavior. Can you talk a little bit more about the resource guarding during play? Um, sure. Do you have a specific question well, about it? Well, just like what we saw here, can you talk about um, what you can do? 
besides take the toy away. Yeah, you know, and resource guarding in a group setting like this is one of the trickiest things. Um, you can work on individually, you know, conditioning a dog to be comfortable with another dog coming up to them, but I generally find that um, it's a problem that in group settings, I do think the best thing to do is just not have the toys around. Um, and I know that's a bit discouraging because it seems like well, that's, you know, <laughs> it does have the air of a cop out about it, but within, there are certain dogs that they, you might be able to help them not be possessive over their toys, you know, in their own home setting, but in a group setting at a park or at a class like this, I find it's very difficult to handle. And I, I, want, I want to say that um, I have learned from practically everyone I talk to that um, this would be a little bit better if I spoke a little more clearly, and I will make every effort to do that. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know that, I realize now that people were having some trouble understanding me, and um, just like dogs who get really aroused can get revved up, when I get really excited, I talk faster and less clearly, that's my default, um, but, um, I think my caffeine load is down, and I'm cognizant of the problem, and um, is, it, is it already a little better, me talking like this? Okay, all right. So we all have room to improve. Um, I'm just gonna show a video um, that's just kind of a, a fun little, oops, a fun little thing. And this white dog is deaf, and that's probably why he's having problems finding this other dog. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, um, moving on with some of the um, videos about watching dog dog play. Um, this is um, uh, two dogs, um, the slightly, they're both black, the slightly larger one um, that's pretty much all black is seven years old and a male. The smaller black one that has some white on its chest is um, 10 years old. And these are pretty familiar dogs. Um, they play a bit rougher than dogs that are unfamiliar with each other uh, in an inappropriate way, but not quite as rough as the when I showed my black lab cross with that Aussie. And there are lots of pauses in this play. And I remember this, this was 2003, and this was the first day of spring in Wisconsin. <laughs> And I think that play was pretty appropriate. There's a lot of bounciness, a certain amount of pauses. Um, they didn't play that often. This was a, a dog that was owned by a, a woman I used to walk with, and our dogs walk together a lot. Trying to get them on video was like the project of an entire week, just trying to get them together and you know, getting them to do it. That's sort of about as long as a play session for them would last. Um, the next video I'm gonna show is that saying the one with the tail held it you know, full, <laughs> full height. Um, is the, um, my dog Bugsy, and then the other one is a dog named Blake that was a Border Collie that Trisha was fostering, and this is their first meeting. And um, there's lots of sniffing and marking and pausing, lots of what I call, I'm a guy, are you a guy? Yes, I'm definitely a guy. Oh, I'm a guy, I'm a guy, I'm a guy. Very, um, lots of marking. Um, and there's, 
and then there's some pausing. There's a little bit of chasing with lots of space, um, quite a bit of cutting each other off, especially the black and white one, cutting off the black one. And then um, you'll see throughout the, the sequence that um, there are several, there are about three sections of the video. It was all over about a 20 minute period, but just sort of beginning, middle, and end. And you'll see throughout that their, um, their bodies and tails are initially quite stiff in the greeting, and then as the progression goes on, they get more relaxed and more playful. Um, there's lots of marking throughout. They're still getting acquainted, but they do get to some more obvious play bows and play behavior. And this is literally just you know, seconds after they met. And you can see they're of the same mold. There's a lot of, I want to sniff your behind, but I don't want you to sniff my behind, which is fair with someone you've just met. The mutual stiff sniffing sometimes happen, happens in greeting before play, but you can see they're still fairly stiff. It's not, I wouldn't really say they're truly playful with one another. You can see they're starting to have some sort of rearing up more of that bounciness of play. But it still is pretty serious to them. They are definitely still getting to know each other. And that to me is the first sign of a much more relaxed play. And my dog usually was with dogs that he was faster than, but this other dog is so much faster than he is. Just sort of flies by him. Wee! <laughs> I've just been playing with you. You can see the body posture is just so much more relaxed all around. You can see the transition that they've made from that initial greeting. And they're still not, you know, like best relaxed pals, but they are playful. And the next video I'm going to show is of two Aussies. One of them you saw before nipping the, the back of one of those dogs in the, 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 um, the sort of pit cross. Um, and these two dogs um, tend to get really aroused and play too roughly with each other and, and actually can hurt each other. The woman who owns them is a professional dog trainer and she can call them off. So she let me videotape them um, and she was right there and you'll, we'll see her hovering. And um, you can see at first they're okay but then there is um, an arousal that's too much. From a videotaping point of view, I would have loved to let them go further but she wasn't comfortable with that which is very reasonable. <laughs> That's actually why I never do live demos and play seminars, because if it really got interesting, I would interrupt them. So it's kind of counterproductive. And I think even though they have vigorous play here, there is some stopping, um, some signaling, and um, uh, it, it gets more uh, revved up from here. Lots of time that sort of almost sneezing sort of behavior or shaking to me are signs of excessive arousal. They can both mean other things as well. And this floor is really good. They're, they're not slipping because of a problem with the floor. They're just too revved up. To 
me, that sort of heavy panting when they haven't been playing that long, and just the rapid movements together are signs of stuff that's a bit too much. This is just some slow motion part of some of the part that I think is, illustrates just how much is going on, how vigorous it is. And she is actually worried about them injuring each other. And once those dogs really get going, um, they don't tend to stop themselves at all. She can call them off. They're um, very well trained. Um, and being able to call your dogs out of play is a great thing to do. Obviously, it can be pretty high level training. But I find that the more difficulty you have in interrupting dogs, the more that's a sign that perhaps they need to be interrupted. If they're that intense on what they're doing, that they sort of are in that, I can't see you, I can't hear you, I certainly can't listen to what you say and actually follow your instructions, the more worrisome it is. So sometimes to see if dogs are playing appropriately, a test that you can do is see, you know, how easy is it to distract them and interrupt them with anything, with, you know, with food, with a toy, with saying, you know, want to go for a walk, here's your dinner, where's your ball, any of those kind of things that would normally be very attention getting for a specific dog. If they can't be um, distracted by those things, that can be quite worrisome. Um, sometimes there's, um, if a dogs do need to be interrupted, some of the classic standbys do work, you know, rattling a bag of treats, um, um, yelping to see if that will be one of the things that could distract one of the dogs that's getting a little bit too much on it. And certainly, um, you can actually go in and get the dogs. This is always a dicey operation. Um, but definitely, um, like most people, I recommend that if you do need to separate dogs physically, to try to pull them out by their back end. A lot of dogs get really distressed if you grab for their collar when they're really revved up like that. I mean, I really recommend to try to be able to separate dogs when they're playing, that you, that you practice it when they're not too revved up, um, or practice it with another dog that, that will stop. I mean, your dog can't keep playing with another dog as easily if that other dog has stopped. Um, when dogs start to look like this, just really um, sort of crazy eye, um, really revved up and starting to escalate, that's a sign that you should definitely interrupt. So keeping in mind that the sort of general rule is this idea of respecting other dogs' bodies for play. These dogs that are separated by, uh, you know, a toy, they're, they're not too near each other's faces, they're pretty respectful. Um, trying to assess whether dogs are willing participants is the main thing. Um, and one of the reasons that this can be hard to judge is because of so many of the exceptions. And two of the biggest exceptions for play that can be hard to assess is play between litter mates and, and closely related play that is uh, between dogs that live in the same house. Sometimes dogs that live in the same house play much rougher with each other. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's okay, but sometimes the standards are a little different. Um, and in terms of litter mates, um, I, I've thought about this a lot because um, these were two dogs that I knew at camp. They were not related, but they were the only pharaoh hounds that each of the others had known since their own litter. And they played together so beautifully. They had such an opportunity to run and chase at such high speed. And you know, they're, they're not the kind of dogs that really are unusual that are going to play with just sort of any other rough and tumble kind of playing. And I came home from camp and I said to my husband, you know, one of the things that struck me at camp was how nice it was. Like, imagine having a play partner that's so perfectly matched to you, you know, that really just goes along with you. You have all the same physical skills and all the phys same physical abilities. Wouldn't that be amazing? And my husband looked at me and he said, you do remember I'm an identical twin, don't you? He has a play buddy just like that. And, and they're litter mates, essentially, in the animal parlance. Um, they actually refer to each other as womb mates, their first womb mates, but litter mates. And, um, and litter mates do often play really, really, really differently. And this is why, to me, um, in, um, hopefully I have a few Harry Potter fans in here at least, 
Um, yay! <laughs> um, in the scene in the fourth movie, when Fred and George Weasley suddenly get attacked by the aging potion and they wrestle with each other and they're 16-year-olds, that is so funny to me because that is my husband and his brother. And I know several other sets of identical twins and they all find this quite hilarious because the way they play is really different. Um, and so those twins in the movie, they really, it's a, you know, the author has hit on many realities of, of human behavior, including that. Um, and so littermates and dogs are no exception. They do sometimes play really rough. Now littermates also can fight a lot. So the fact that they're playing rough, it does, it's not okay because they're littermates, but sometimes they just are very well matched and will play that way. Um, and what you really need to assess is, are they willing? Um, is there any risk of injury? Um, are there serious asymmetries in that? Um, and I'm going to show a video um, of two dogs that live in the same house. And if I just saw this little clip myself, just cold, like you're going to see it, I would think, oh, I don't know, this is pretty rough. They're growling a lot, and they have very vigorous play. Um, but I know these dogs. They're my neighbors. And it's a three-and-a-half-year-old Aussie mix and a nine-year-old lab. And they only ever play for like a minute at a time. I had a very hard time getting this video because if I ever saw them start to play and then ran inside to get my video camera, it was too late. I just happened to be there one time videotaping their kids and their dogs started to play. Um, and their play is usually just a couple minutes. They can be called off easily, either being, you know, asking to sit or called to come. And they do have some pauses and play signals in there. Go get her! Go get her! And of course, the child is helping by goading them on. Get her! Get her out! Get her! And they're done. And again, if I saw that, that is some pretty rough play, and there seems to be a lot of teeth flashing, and it looks pretty exciting. But they tend to do this a couple times a day for a minute or two. Sometimes one's more seems like the aggressor, if you will. Sometimes it, it doesn't. It it never seems to go anywhere. So um, it's not necessarily my favorite type of play to watch. I still always have this like hmm. But you know, they've lived together for three years, and that's sort of as bad as it ever gets. And so the context is really important. Um, I'm going to be showing a videotape now about a dog. Um, it's a German Shepherd at a park, and it is not a very polite German Shepherd. And in fact, um, I think this dog is sort of trying to do interactions with dogs. I'm not even sure whether you could call it any attempts that it has to do with play. It certainly lacks a lot of social skills. It sort of does a lot of things wrong. It, it charges at dogs, it mounts, it growls. Um, it rolls another dog, which I mostly miss on the videotape spinning around, but you see the aftermath of it. Um, and I feel like this German Shepherd is just sort of running around looking to mix it up. And um, when I was watching, it was with a really old camera, old VHS, looking through like this, I couldn't really um, even see that much what was going on until I got home and saw the tape. I mean, I saw enough to follow this dog. I thought it was interesting. And there was a Rottweiler in this tape that, that was around all the time. And I, looking through that little tiny finder and hardly being able to see it, I was concerned the two of them might be about to get into some kind of serious trouble. But after seeing it on the screen at home, I think the Rottweiler was actually trying to uh, calm things down, kind of like a, you know, like a, acting like the social police, if you will. Um, and um, you, know, you don't see a lot of play signals in this, and you just generally see a dog that's sort of out of control. And I videotaped this, this dog just sort of at the, the park, kept going like this, until finally I noticed the owners watching me and, and stopped out of sheer, like, awkwardness. And um, I actually, uh, I, I, I think it might be on the, the very end of my original tape, I just sort of smiled at them awkwardly and said, she's so pretty. It was really awkward. <laughs> and um, felt really bad. Um, and I, after I watched this tape, I went back to the park many, many times and tried to see these dogs again, the, the German Shepherd and the Rottweiler, and I never saw them. So that's the, the shepherd, that you, the only shepherd in the view. And she's a year old spayed female. Hey, 
and the dog just tends to sort of charge into things kind of in a freight train kind of way. And you see that this Rottweiler is kind of tailing, but it almost has a martial arts kind of way of just receiving the energy and trying to let it go. <laughs> it was very muddy. This was the, probably the first day of summer in Wisconsin. <laughs> And I feel like this dog had kind of a franticness about her, just really agitated. And I don't know the dog, but she's certainly the kind of dog that I would want to be looking into her exercise and her nutrition and, you know, massage techniques, anything to sort of calm that arousal. And I really actually feel sorry for this dog. I feel like she's just looking for something. She's just, you know, sort of there's an, an unsatisfied aspect of her. She sort of mugs this dog here. I'll take your ball, thanks. And even here when the dog sits for the owner lookout, sort of looking at the Rottweiler in an agitated way. And this is right when I realized, like, oh, these people are watching me. <laughs> Let's stop. And, you know, throughout that, I never saw that German Shepherd do anything that was really sort of signs of playfulness, per se, um, and no play signals at all. Um, and actually, play signals are, are something I'm going to be talking about for quite a bit here now. Um, and play signals, to me, are a really interesting aspect of play. And I think the first question about play signals that really naturally has to be asked is why do dogs have them or why do any animals have them? And the reason for play signals is that um, any animals who have the huge potential of injuring each other and many animals that play do, I mean dogs have weapons, they have their claws, they have their full body force, they have their teeth, um, they need to be able to avoid misunderstandings. If the actions that are involved in play are not perceived as play, you can get a really serious problem. And since so many of the actions of play come from things like predation and fighting and even courtship, there's real possibility for an animal not understanding that uh, an animal that's you know, running at them or charging at them or batting at them is being playful without um, an, an, a specific indication. And so, Play signals seem to translate loosely to mean, I want to play, I still want to play, what follows is not real, or what follows is not literal, or there's no intent to harm. And um, they most likely evolved to either start or maintain social play. And those are two different things. Starting play and maintaining social play are obviously related, but they are different. One way of thinking of it is that play signals function to foster cooperation between individuals. Play is necessarily a cooperative venture. There has to be an agreement, sort of a, a suspension of, of reality, a suspension of what these things would mean in serious context in order for play to happen. And if play is 
misinterpreted as some other activity. There's the risk of fear, there's the risk of pain or injury, or the risk of social damage. And play signals seem to function to try to avoid that. Now, there are a lot of dogs who know how to play, but don't know how to signal properly. And this tends to be um, not much of a problem with dogs who already know each other, because there's sort of an assumption of a playful intent. If you have a, you know, a, a couple of dogs in your house and they play every day and they've lived together for years and there's never been a fight, then the, the play is sort of assumed by the dogs, it seems. Um, but dogs who don't know how to play signal but try to play with an unfamiliar dog more often run into trouble. And, um, and sometimes that, that can be worked out if the dog that's on the receiving end of this sort of charge or potentially dangerous behavior that is meant in a playful way but hasn't been announced as such, if that receiving dog just sort of makes a gamble and, um, and doesn't react in any inappropriate way, or I don't mean inappropriate, that they would be well within their rights to react defensively, but I mean in a way that if they react in a playful way, then sometimes after a few harrowing episodes, those dogs can play together. They've become familiar dogs. Um, but it's much harder. And play signals are just generally needed more with, with unfamiliar individuals. And I think of this in terms of people, because people do play signal. Um, my husband and his bro both his brothers, they play really roughly, and they're always leaping on each other and pouncing, and there's never been a fight you know, in 35 years. But if one of them just went up to one of you and just suddenly pounced on you, you'd be well within your rights to, you know, to punch him. <laughs> it would seem very strange. Or if you were on the street and some random stranger came up to you. And that's the equivalent of what a lot of dogs do, just running and charging at dogs without signaling first. Well, the play bow is the best known play signal in dogs. And the, the play bow is, is highly stereotyped. And that means that its form is pretty constant. Um, dogs, they tend to put their, their, uh, you know, their elbows down. They're behind up in the air. Um, and some of them bark and some wag. But the actual structure of the behavior is pretty constant. I'm sure we've all seen it thousands of times. And there's not a lot of confusion about whether something is a play bow or not. Um, but the fact that play bows are, are stereotyped like this um, um, probably means that, there's, that there was some selection on them, there was some importance in evolutionary history for that not to be ambiguous. Stereotyped signals are often in, in some kind of signal that needs very um, great clarity. And in thinking about the play bow from, uh, um, just as, as the actual behavior itself and, and why it might be what it is, um, it's, a, it's a posture that dogs can maintain for a pretty long time without losing their balance. Um, it puts their head low, so there's a possibility that it makes them appear less threatening than they otherwise would. And um, it's a posture from which dogs can then do a lot of things. You know, they can back up out of it, they can leap up, they can turn and run. It's a very versatile starting posture for a lot of things. Um, in some research about play bows, there's some interesting things about just actually what it means for play and then what it means for in terms of actually how dogs think um, or what their minds are capable of. Um, so play bows are performed throughout sequences of play, but they're most often seen at the beginning, which suggests that a major role is actually initiating play. Um, and that many play bows that occur in the middle of sequences um, occur before or after actions that are most likely to be misinterpreted, specifically like biting and shaking kind of behaviors. And the conclusion that the researchers that have studied this have made is that it's probably important for dogs to um, clarify their actions before they do them, like what, you know, I'm about to do something playful and then this big sort of potentially confused or confusing action that could be perceived as something um, serious, or after it's done, like, see, that wasn't so bad, I still want to play. They do seem to occur before most often immediately before and after the most likely behaviors that could be misinterpreted. Um, play bows that occur in the middle of play sessions are actually a little bit more variable, both in terms of time and form, than the ones that occur at the beginning. And some of the theories about this are that, um, um, that there's less need to be completely clear at that time. Once play's already started, that's one possibility. Another possibility is that dogs are fatigued and their, um, their um, behavior is less controlled as a result, um, which just shows that some people have never <laughs> met a Vishla or a Brittany, but anyway. Um, but the, and another possibility is that, um, is that the dogs enter the play bout from a wider, wider variety of postures when they're in the middle of a play bout, a play bout and that's why the play bouts might be variable. 
Um, in the recent study that I mentioned um, earlier about dyadic play between dogs, that was the Bauer and Smut study, they defined a couple of other play signals that are really closely related to play bows. And they just um, define these for the sake of making distinctions in their study. Um, one of them is called a start-stop. And they define this as um, when a dog from a standstill position and looking directly at their play partner, the dog quickly lowers the front end of the body, although not as low as a play bow, and sometimes quickly bounces up in front of the, par of the partner. And um, I think people have seen this a lot. You know, a lot of people call them mini play bows, or they sort of just look like a sort of a stuttering um, kind of play bow. And they also define a bounce bow, which is similar to the start-stop, but involves repeated bounces as the dog appears to dance around the partner. And I think it's interesting that they made these distinctions because a lot of people do consider play bows or things play bows even if the dog's um, you know, forelimbs aren't completely on the ground. And they've made this distinction. And I think it'd be really interesting just for all of us watching our dogs to see if we see any kind of um, association between when they do these various things because they are a little bit different. And um, besides the play bow and the other things related to them, um, there are a, a lot of other play signals. Um, dogs will often signal play by rolling onto their back. Um, I feel like I tend to see this more in puppies, but the first person I mentioned that to said, oh, that's funny, I feel like I see that more in adults. It hasn't been quantified, um, but there might be some kind of an age link. Um, leaping is often a way to initiate play. You can see that the dog that's doing the leaping seems to be a lot more interested in play than the one that's being leaped at, but nonetheless, that's not always the case. Um, another sort of play signal is an exaggerated approach and withdrawal where dogs sort of dart forward and dart back and sometimes repeatedly. And I think this is um, particularly effective um, at initiating play with dogs that are hesitant to play. Um, dogs, like many other species, have a play face. And play faces across species are highly variable, but they do tend to have an open mouth, um, generally relaxed facial muscles, and, and and open eyes. In various species, there's different aspects of the, of the, um, what the eyebrows do. In dogs, they seem to be pretty relaxed. Um, another way that dogs initiate play, um, another play signal is a staggering gait. Um, these are sight hounds. They tend to have a, you know, a very um, open gait, um, very large strides. And when they do this sort of, um, almost like they're stotting, um, that sort of little stutter steps, that can often initiate play. And I've mentioned quite a bit that pauses in play are good. And there, there aren't any data that look at this specifically. But I think it's possible that one of the major functions of play bows is that it does promote pauses in play. And perhaps other play signals do that as well. When you're running and chasing and rolling, and then you do a play bow, that's necessarily a pause. And I often feel like when I'm watching dogs and they're pausing, especially with play signals, I feel much more confident that the animals have the ability to rein in their own arousal. Um, play that is most likely to accelerate into difficulties, to me, is the play that's uninterrupted. There's just never a break. That's how it sort of spirals up out of control. I'm going to show a, sort of a little edited video. This is just the same puppies, the very first video that we saw of the puppies in Nicaragua. That was about a two, two and a half minute video. This is just about 25 seconds that pieces together some of the play signals. You see quite a few leaps, um, quite a few play bows, and, um, and a little bit of rolling. Just, it's one of the things I liked about their play is how many play signals they had. And play signals occur in a lot of species, but they've actually been the best studied in dogs, which is really refreshing because there's such a feeling, I think, in a lot of animal behavior that, that dogs are, you know, they're living in our houses, they're not in a real habitat, or they're not real animals. And it's so nice to see a move, especially in recent years, that, that they are an animal worthy of study, as all of us have already known, of course.